if you check the children, the children match up. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? Sometimes that is better. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Long days and pleasant nights, fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower. As I mean Fuego, and if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on hail to Stephen King. That's Reezy, everybody, and uh, obviously, bienvenidos, and welcome to the horror show. This is a segment that I have been talking about for quite some time, to be honest, and it is revisiting the Dark Tower comic books. Yeah, so we did reviews of, I believe, the original Gunslinger Born and then uh, The Long Road Home, which is the second installment, and yet we never got to Treachery, Battle of Jericho Hill, Fall of Gilead, you know, the rest of that original arc, which was so incredibly compelling and really fleshed out a lot of stuff that has only been hinted at from King in a lot of his work with those books. And so, most definitely, I will just, uh, in this revisiting sort of fashion, will give some revisiting thoughts, obviously, like some additional rumination and, you know, context and interest and stuff. It's still going to be relatively non-spoilery. I'm not going to go into, you know, the fate of certain characters, which we all know is a big thing within this. But, yeah, I'm definitely going to say why I love it and why I think it still holds up and why it is a good almost like entry point for those who have, you know, had interest in checking out the Dark Tower. And it, I, I cannot lament enough frustration and sadness in the fact that Wheel of Time is like blowing up on Amazon Prime right now. And everybody loved Game of Thrones. And, you know, and, you know, The Witcher is a big thing on Netflix. And yeah, there are so many different fantasy based series that have taken off especially of the obscure variety. And yet, for whatever reason, we just cannot do the Dark Tower right. And I think you could do it right by doing it the way that I saw it in these comic books. And that's where you focus upon the melding of the Western and uh, there's you know a little bit of horror elements here and there, but really more so than anything else, this is a medieval fantasy sort of story. We are talking about a descendant of the line of Eld, you know, I mean, Arthur himself. And so, yes, you could really focus on that sort of thing as they do in these comics, and that's why the comics were so damn popular, and they had how many different runs? I mean, there were five with this particular series, and then they did a few more with both the Gunslinger and adapting the drawing of the three. But this is where I will contend that they lost the interest of a lot of readers and maybe they just kind of called it off because the Dark Tower eventually gets in the storytelling capacity to modern day and our world. And I know a lot of people love that particular portion of it. I'm, I'm a little less into it. You know, I have always said that the drawing of the three is not one of my particular favorites where there's like the world jumping and we're bringing in, you know, people from, I guess it's not Keystone Earth, it's obviously like a different version of our Earth at that particular point. But nonetheless, man, I, that's where the story loses me and, and yet it regains my attention once it gets back in the third book to the wastelands and I, I know that's a you know jumpy sort of book and the fact that it's a little bit both in earth and in midworld but nonetheless like i am very much about when the story just stays in these weird alternate universes and you know the world that has moved on and the strange fantasy medieval-y sort of aspect of it even though as it's doubled down in this Marvel comic book which was initially published in February of 2007 and so uh, I'm basically going to be covering these uh, and like series by series so I'm starting out today with the Gunslinger Born and then we will go into you know uh, all of the, the Long Road Home, you know, treachery and all that different stuff. And so, yeah, I'm going to be hitting it up from a just story arc by story arc sort of standpoint like Cecil and I originally intended all those years ago and just didn't get to. But as far as just like further rumination goes, I am most compelled with the exploration of the fact that 
this was a world that had moved on. So this was presumably our world previously, you know, and, and they really, this is one of the few books and I think it's kind of tough for some to actually kind of rationalize and then that's the trouble with multiverses and everything, you know, is the fact that, so in Roland's world, his world at one point was once like ours, from my interpretation, from my guesstimation, I guess. And so that's why we have Sitco and we have these old like oil places and you know modern machines that are at least that we would perceive as modern like tanks and things of that nature but yet those are described as being from the old ones and so yeah like Roland's world is at least his level of the tower his existence of reality is way beyond it, it's almost like you know, some of the dystopian stuff that we have seen and read where it's like there was a modern society and then society fell and then it rose back up sort of situation. And yet it's not like a dark ages sort of thing where I still remember a school teacher who was telling me that, yeah, if we were eventually to uh, have seen where the progression of science and thinking and everything was going back in the times of the Romans and, you know, even before then the Greeks and everything, <laughs> you kids would have been going on field trips to the moon. And I still very believe that to be a thing because, yeah, the Dark Ages happened and so much knowledge was lost and had to be regained and it was almost like rebooting your computer sort of situation. And so that is the backstory about the Dark Tower that has always fascinated me far more than even Roland's journey, I guess, you know, trying to find this tower. And I think maybe that cynicism lies within the fact that I know how things end and how cause a wheel, everybody. And so it's like, yeah, and then the just reiteration, reciprocation, and, and you know, just tediousness of that entire process and whatever. But um, nonetheless, <laughs> after that slight little rant of sorts, I want to talk about the first installment in this big bad bastard right here. Seriously, this omnibus is a crusher, and I've shown it on the channel previously, so I'm not going to go into like extensiveness, but. So this encompasses all five of the stories that, uh, yeah, were done about Young Roland. And I've mentioned on this channel as well countless times that Young Roland is my favorite of the Dark Tower. And that, I think that's where I get so much derision from a lot of people because everybody loves Jake and Oi and Susanna and, uh, and you know Eddie and everything. And yet for me, what captivated me immensely was everything with the old contact and with Roland as a youngster and that's why I love Little Sisters so much. That's why I love uh, Went Through the Keyhole, obviously being 4.5 and being another young Roland story with him and Jamie. But yeah, man, this is, this is probably a great access point as I kind of touched upon for somebody who wants to get into the lore of the Dark Tower and most notably the high speech because damn, then we have this narrator throughout the entirety and they talk in every aspect of it and it's uh, it's very amusing and very just intriguing if you're into that sort of thing and I just want to give a brief little bit of it. So let's read, shall we? See this now, see it well. A man dressed all in ebony sprinting across a white, blinding, and waterless desert. He makes deep noises in his throat. Do you not hear them? Might be the ragged despair of a rabbit approaching its limits. Might be the chuckling of a fox planning to turn the tables on its hunter. Mayhap be either or both, whatever please you. Can't say for sure. All I can say for sure is this. Yes. The iconic line, we all know. The man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. If the gunslinger looks familiar to you, well, that's as may be. Echoes of him have been seen in tales spun across many other places in many other ways. Just as stories of a great flood, for instance, cut across the consciousness of all mankind, so too. He is iconic and legend and your best friend. 
Praise the man Jesus and your worst enemy, your damnation or your salvation, and sometimes not even or, but and. Do you can it? The only thing he shares with his quarry is that he is known by many names, if one such as he can be said to be known at all. The gunslinger is a creature of what ye would call destiny, and he calls Ka. Ka's a wheel. It's one purpose to turn, and in the end it always comes back to the place where it had started. The gunslinger's Ka turns toward an inevitable goal, a dark tower. But as the wheel turns, it also leads him back towards that which is long past. Friends, loved ones, a land once thriving now dead, and a father whose face must never be forgotten. So they give a terrific introduction, because that was the very beginning of this story. They give a terrific introduction to the lore, and it's very much like a Dark Tower for Dummies, but yet also brings the story to a much more interesting sense of seriousness. So yeah, in the first issue, we get all of the young Roland stuff from the first book. So there's flashbacks in the first Dark Tower book, The Gunslinger. And it's back to him, they omit the, you know, scene of the cook getting hanged and all that other stuff, so they don't do that. But they basically focus very succinctly on the infidelity, unfortunately, of Gabrielle, his mother, with Martin, the wizard, and everything. And with that being a catalyst for the fact that uh, Roland is like, yo, it's time. I'm going to get my birthright of sorts. I'm going to get my guns. I'm going to officially become a gunslinger at the age of 14, two years younger than even his father, Stephen Deschain. And so, yeah, that's big time sort of thing. And Court, who is this portly, <laughs> courtly, yeah, that sort of trainer of these gunslingers, these new... I guess, like Western sheriffs, you know, that are descendants of the Knights of the Round Table sort of craziness. So it's, it's an interesting sort of progression and transgression in that regard. And yeah, he wins it. And yet he wins it in a very wily way with the use of his hawk. So yeah, th there is a very interesting portion that and there, there is so much within this, I, I must admit, that is hinted at within those books. Uh, you know, both one and four, which is where this derives all of its inspiration from. And yet the just different perspective, different turn of that proverbial wheel is very fascinating to me because there's stuff that King talks about in the narrative proper that we see fleshed out significantly more. And then there's other things that obviously are you know, just scaled back, especially once we get to the rest of the story, because this is a seven issue series. And so the first issue is essentially, yeah, the gunslinger flashbacks, or at least portions of them from that first book. And then the rest of it, uh, with the exception of a little bit at the beginning of two, where we see, yeah, we see the Crimson King. He wasn't even mentioned in the first few books, but yeah, the visage of him is just flat out awesome. And it's, it's in later installments, they really, you know, flesh it out proper. But you see him defleshing people, man, and like eating a head and all that different stuff. So, yeah, he is back in, uh, yeah, in uh, D Discordia doing his thing. And yeah, yeah, it's cool. But uh, the way that they flesh this out, though, is very compelling to me because they do kind of marginalize it down and streamline it to the core factors of the love story in these later issues between none other than Susan Delgado and Roland Deschain, obviously. And so it's very much a tragic love story in that regard and so very sad. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to mention the extent of that. I guess even mentioning Romeo and Juliet, it's kind of... Eh, Kind of indicative, unfortunately, but I was hook, line, and sinker just based on the fact that there was going to be this sort of tragic love story of sorts. But one of my complaints, I suppose, is that the the his support team, his early quartet, you know, because yeah, we had Eddie and you know Susanna and Jake and Oi in this later incarnation of the quartet that we get in you know the other books and whatever, but. Um, 
in this particular indication, um, in this incarnation, you just have a couple friends and they're so wet behind the ears and they're such big time kids and everything. And I feel like everything about this book, as much as I adore it, has much more of a sense of seriousness to it in comparison with the ebb and flow that we most notably get in Wizard and Glass from Psy King. And I know everybody is like, oh, it's such a bloated story. It's like two stories in one, uh, yada, yada, yada. I've heard so many complaints about that Dark Tower installment. And it always bums me out, unfortunately, because it's my favorite Dark Tower book is Wizard and Glass. But once again, that's because it's focusing on young Roland and it has this whole story within it. And we do, in this Marvel comic adaptation, lose the sense of one of my favorite Psy King characters and one of my favorite Dark Tower characters, you know, in none other than uh, <laughs> Mr. Cuthbert, you know, Bert, as we call him so affectionately. Bert, his humor is scaled back significantly, and I know it's probably because of the fact that some of it was just goofy, lame humor, but that was really what made the character in a lot of ways to me and very much like him and Eddie are almost like parallels along Roland's path on that beam and so yeah the fact that he is much more of a stoic and like serious character in the comics that's one thing that I can definitely take exception to and really there's a lot of those nuances that with the bloatedness of Wizard and Glass, you're not gonna get in this. So yeah, there is a little bit of the touching on the story of, you know, big bad Jonas being involved with, uh, you know, Cordelia. And there is less Rhea, there's very much less of both Elaine and Cuthbert. And so that may be a detriment for some, but really it, it captures the core of the love story and also expands a little bit on the military intrigue of everything that the affiliation is trying to do with the you know John Farson and yet that is definitely one thing that I will say is in the first issue they retcon something and I guess King had to give his clearance on it presumably because John Farson, Walter O'Dim, Martin Broadcloak, the man in black, the walking dude they're all the same guy, as King himself said, but there is a sense of separation, which they initially hint at the fact that there is a synonymousness, and then there are a few scenes in the comic where they basically strike that from the record, and they do give that sense of separation. Not trying to spoil stuff, obviously, which is why I'm dancing around using names and whatever. I don't like what they did. I feel that... Uh, you know, Flag is most definitely the most iconic Stephen King villain ever, beyond, you know, Grey slash Pennywise, Greywise, whatever you want to call him, and various others. And so, for that reason, I was, like, RF has been in so many incarnations, you know, and yet, yeah, I guess, farce and, you know, it's, anyway, uh, it is what it is, and yet, artwork is what I have to touch upon here, everybody. Artwork is utterly amazing in this. So you have the combination of Jaili working along with Richard uh, Eisenhoff, and then uh, just from the writing standpoint too, blessings to Robin Firth for actually being like the story consultant, so to speak, as the Dark Tower historian and working with Peter David to make sure that not only does our narrator have this very profound and very distinctive voice and talking in the high speech throughout, you know, if you can't, and everything as far as references and the due diligence that would have to be in place for this sort of story, I think is intricately done. And yet, yes, they do streamline certain situations, but they hit all of the big moments from, I mean, the loss of Roland's virginity after, you know, knocking down court to also the standoff in the bar where, you know, Shimi has spilled all that camel piss or whatever the hell it is on DePape. And that's where Bert finally asserts himself into the situation. And for the first time in the comic, really, like, feels like himself, honestly, at least as far as from the source pages and everything. Um, that standoff is terrifically done. Uh, another scene from the first issue that is really imperative and just 
solidifies the standoffishness and the utter hatred and the constrained relationship between Roland and his mother and her treachery of sleeping with this guy who has essentially, he's enchanted her. I mean, he turns all those guards into like pugs at one particular point, which is really funny. But yeah, that scene was very well done. Uh, I don't know, all, all, all the stuff with Eyebolt Canyon in the big finale that we eventually get to, the love scenes with just the internal thoughts of Susan Delgado, and yet we have the classic King foreshadowing too, where you're like, oh, these two are doomed. He, they're saying it in the early issues when he first meets her, when she's leaving Rhea's after being checked out for the fact that if she's a, a virgin or not, you know, and so and they hit all of the most pivotal points as far as like major beats that will just forever be remembered, I would imagine, from those who have read the books already, but yet who are gravitating over to this, and yet it is streamlined enough, in my estimation, for those that have never read any of the first four Dark Tower books, and most notably one and four, which is where this derives its inspiration from. But yeah, man, I cannot credit the, the Gunslinger Born enough for all of the interesting things that it brings for the, the, the approach to the visuals. And yes, being Jai Lee, it does have kind of a slight pseudo animate sort of look, but I think it's like the darkness and the shading with characters more often than not that really adds an essence of ambiance to this. There are so many instances where you only see the silhouette of a character, as opposed to actually seeing the bright and beautiful face of Susan, or, I mean, yeah, Roland is portrayed as a very young, handsome, I mean, he's from a, like, descendants of royalty, as both of them are, well, all three of them, now that I think about it, and so, yeah, I, he is, he has a youthfulness, but he has a very interesting edge, as you can see from the visuals here. And so for that reason, it just continues to captivate to this day. And I know Simon & Schuster is actually doing the, they did re-releases of all of these, at least uh, up until this point. And so this big bastard monster, my goodness, it's, uh, yeah, it is of the thickness and it's got both the regular release comic books and then it also has a separate sort of like compendium uh, companion, as they call it here, and it's got all of those little bonus things that further flesh out all of the different orbs, you know, and then, you know, Marilyn's balls and all that, then that's kind of funny, and various other aspects about, and there's maps, there's just continuous world building. This takes the Dark Tower to significantly further heights, in my estimation, than the Stephen King books originally did, and it was at his blessing, you know? And Robin Firth is the, the right-hand person who has assisted him with even keeping things in context and continuity and all of that, and so that is incredibly fascinating. And yes, I know I didn't, like, focus upon the story specific as much because I think those who have not read it before, you have a young gunslinger who basically just wins his way into adulthood with the sheer form of a uh, like potent combination of anger, skill, and I guess heredity is probably, you know, being, you know, the descendant of Stephen in that regard, and then is sent on this mission as a spy, falls in love, and then shit gets really crazy from there, and there's all kinds of different levels of intrigue. You have a corrupt mayor, you've got, you know, just mischievous aunt who was trying to pair up Susan, her, you know, whose father has died recently, and, you know, with this mayor whose wife can't bear children, and so she's essentially going to be like a concubine. And yes, there's a lot of moving pieces within this, and there's far more moving pieces within Wizard and Glass, the fourth book, but really at the heart of this, it is a coming of age story. And it's not like actually written, written by Stephen King, but it's basing off of his work. And it doesn't really deviate that far from that being at the core of the story. And at the core of the story, it is most definitely about maturing, I guess. And it's brilliantly illustrated and seeing a visual to 
those great ideas and those very intriguing beats. Uh, I don't know, I'm pushing 40 and yet I still love a good coming of age story, especially when there is like, I was gonna use a term like swashbuckling, but like gunslinging craziness about and adventure involved. And yeah, I cannot recommend The Gunslinger Born enough, which is the first seven issues that ran from February to August of 2007. Next month, I am going to be hitting up the second installment, which is entitled The Long Road Home. There are still three others after that. And this is gonna be a new ongoing monthly series that just yeah, focuses upon everything Dark Tower comic book and just revisits all of that. So revisiting the Dark Tower comics courtesy of Marvel. So I've been Ivy Fuego and I extend a grande gracias. You can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on the YouTubies. Yeah, some upcoming reviews to look forward to over there is a bunch of Christmas coverage, most notably 8-Bit Christmas, which is an HBO Max that I absolutely loved. And then there was also Home Sweet Home Alone, various other things, and yeah, you can hear the helicopter flying over me, which is delightful. But yeah, lots of coolness coming in the month of December to look forward to, and obviously liking, sharing, subscribing, doing all those things here is greatly appreciated. And uh, yeah, guys, the book of the month is none other than right behind me there, Lacey's Story, so look forward to that. And yeah, I guess until the wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant readers and viewers alike say thank you. Hopeful that we share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. I hope we have been well met as well. And until then, remember to stay scared and read Stephen King. Seriously, these Dark Tower comics, I am so excited about covering them further because they are so dope. Look at this thing. It's freaking huge.